Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hey guys, Kevin Cruz here. Welcome to the LeadX Leadership Show, where we help you to stand out and to get ahead at work. Now, as you know, we like to switch things up here, keep it interesting, and to continue that tradition, today on the podcast, instead of me interviewing an expert guest, we're going to have the guest deep dive into their topic. You see, you'll be hearing audio from a LeadX webinar. Now, of course, there are dozens of great webinars on leadership, management, communication, productivity, and more, all archived in the LeadX app. Just visit leadx.org for more information about our webinar archive. So enough on the setup, enough background information. Here is Vanya Mathis to introduce our guest and to hand it over to them. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to The Good Fight. Today, you're going to learn from a host that helps people address their conflict debt and learn how to use that conflict you have for good. Uh, our host is the New York Times bestselling author of You First, Inspire Your Team to Grow Up, Get Along, and Get Stuff Done. She's a regular contributor to the Harvard Business Review and an organizational psychology expert for Quartz Magazine. As the co-founder of Three Co's Inc., she advises on business strategy and executive team effectiveness and has worked with executives at companies like Amazon, Walmart, TD Bank, and Sony PlayStation. She has a PhD in organizational psychology and her new book, The Good Fight, Use Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track, was just released. Please welcome Dr. Leanne Davey. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to uh, have this conversation today and share a little bit with you about my new book, The Good Fight, How to Use Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track. So I know uh, you've already heard a little bit, but just so you can see my smiling face and get a little bit of the background, uh, I am by way of training. Uh, I did a PhD in organizational psychology, and I've spent the last 25 years helping teams deal with the messy people stuff. And that's really my favorite uh, stuff to work on with all sorts of organizations you'd know really, really well, but shh, we can't tell any stories. Okay, so let's, uh, let's keep going. So what is this book, The Good Fight? Um, what's it all about? So one of the things I like to say is it's actually two books in one. So it's uh, a book about fighting, fighting at work, and how important it is that we fight at work to have more effective teams and more productive organizations. So I say for the people who are like me who don't like conflict, I'm really conflict averse. This is a book that teaches you that some things are worth fighting for. So that's one of the books that's inside this book. But the second one is sometimes people say to me, oh, Leanne, I don't have any problem fighting. <laughs> and I say, oh, okay, then you might need the good part. Because sometimes people are too quick to fight and they do it in a way that's all focused on the issue, but doesn't take into account the fact that you know what? There's humans attached to these kinds of topics and discussions at work. So they leave a lot of collateral damage. So for them, this book is about the good. So whether you need uh, the fight part or the good part, the good fight's got something in it for you. The book is organized into three main sections. The first section is the case for conflict. And I'm going to go into some depth on that here. The second section is called the conflict code, which is all the how. How do I do it, Leanne? How do I have conflict in a way that makes my organization more productive? How do I have conflict in a way that actually makes people trust me more instead of thinking I'm the bad guy? And how do I have conflict in a way that at the end of the day, I can look in the mirror and be proud of myself? That's what the second section of the book is about. I'm actually not going to spend that much time on that today. And there are lots of other places on my website you can find that information. Because I want to save time for the third one, which is, I think, the most exciting idea for many of us in organizations, which is, how do I create a conflict habit? And I want to share with you one exercise today that's been wildly popular. And, and I know that when you get off this webinar, if you actually try and implement it with your team, it's going to create amazing results. So I'm going to focus on the first bit, 
What's this case for conflict? And the third bit, how do I create a conflict habit on my team? So we use our small amount of time together wisely. Okay, let's keep going. So what do you mean we need conflict, Leanne? That sounds crazy. Well, we do. But first, let's all agree on what we mean by the word conflict, because it's not as scary as we think it is. And I'm certainly not encouraging people to have fisticuffs in the boardroom. So what is conflict? It's just the struggle resulting from incompatible or opposing needs, drives, wishes, or external or internal demands. And you know what? We all have those every single day. Oh, I really, I want to stay and get this finished, but I got to get home. Or, oh, both of those projects sound amazing and they would really move our organization forward, but we can't have, we don't have the resources to do them both. Or, you know what, I've got to allocate this workload to somebody. Everybody's really busy. So it's a hard call to decide who's going to pick up this slack. So common conflicts happen all the time. So as I said, trade-offs between priorities or uh, here's another one. I have to give somebody feedback that they don't want to hear. Well, it's uncomfortable, but it's important. It's how we grow and develop. So there's a million reasons why organizations require conflict, but here's the problem. We, as humans, yeah, we hate conflict. Why? Well, first of all, because we're biologically wired to get along with people in our in-group. We had to evolve and survive. We didn't want to get voted out of the cave and eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So it was important biologically that we have a motive to get along. But it doesn't stop there. As kids, we're socialized. We grow up with all these voices whispering in our ears about why conflict isn't polite and it isn't nice. Like the grandma who said, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Or a teacher who kept telling us to mind our own business. So we've learned to stay out of conflicts on our team because Well, it doesn't involve us. So all of these voices in our head, I call them the itty bitty shitty committee. They whisper these things in our ear that tell us that it's not okay to have conflict. And and it's so, so wrong. We need conflict. Our organizations require us to work through these things. And if we don't, that's when we get into big trouble. Organizations require conflict humans run from it. And the problem is we end up in what I call conflict debt. Conflict debt, it's the pileup of all those issues that should have been addressed, but instead are undiscussed and more importantly, unresolved. So you can get into conflict debt in a whole bunch of ways. You can just completely avoid a topic altogether. How many of you recognize this one? Oh, um, we'll just take that offline, right? And you know that that means we'll bury it in a dark hole and never speak of it again. I get it. So that's a big problem. Sometimes we we do say, oh, but Leanne, uh, we discuss it. But you actually make sure that the people who are going to disagree with you aren't in the room. Well, that's conflict debt too, because that conflict's still there. You just have been avoiding it by only talking to the people who agree, creating that echo chamber of supporters. But the third thing we do is we actually note you like, okay, Leanne, I'm discussing it and I have all the right people in the room. But the minute that it gets uncomfortable and we really get to the root issues, maybe that's where we take it offline. We say, yeah, or we move it to the meeting after the meeting because we don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation in a room full of people. So that conflict debt piles up and we pay interest on it. So not only do we have the problem of not addressing the issue in the first place, but think of the compounding interests. So one of the most prevalent conflict debts in organizations is the failure to prioritize. So we want to say to our leaders, okay, but there can't be seven priorities. What's the most important? And we just refuse to answer. So the problem is we pay interest by diluting our resources across everything, by burnout and and us having workloads that are unmanageable. And that creates tremendous stress. So we have conflict debt. That's one thing. But it compounds. And depending on what started the conflict debt in the first place, it can create animosity among colleagues. It can create stress for individuals. Or it just creates that lack of engagement and mistrust for an organization overall. So we don't want to get into conflict debt. It's way too costly. So 
That's the first big idea. Let's move on to the second really big important idea. The idea of creating a conflict habit. So in creating a conflict habit, I want you to completely change the metaphors and change the language you use to talk about the purpose of teamwork. The biggest problem is most of us think that conflict or tension means that we're doing a bad job of being a team. We're not happy and getting along and it doesn't feel like we're all in the same boat. Well, if that's the language you're using about teams, no wonder people are you know, taking that conflict offline or making sure that the issues go unresolved. It's really important for you people to understand that conflict and tensions, they're not the antithesis of a team. They're one of the main benefits. If everybody thinks alike, what, what do you need a team for? So the way I like to talk about this, conflict on teams, it's a feature, not a bug. And that's a big mindset shift because this is what we've had on the walls. We've had these pictures of the rowers. <laughs> and that makes everybody feel like we're always supposed to be pulling in the same direction. And we're not. Sure, we're supposed to have the same goal or the same destination. Absolutely, that's what makes us a team. But we don't get there by everyone pulling in the same direction. If the salesperson and the operations person are pulling in the same direction, your company is going to have major problems. You better hope that your salesperson is pulling really hard for customization and differentiation that allows you to sell and create a compelling value proposition for your, for your customers. But at the same time, if the operations folks aren't driving toward greater consistency so you can create more efficiency, well, then that's going to be a problem too. You're going to make sales, but the margins are going to be terrible. So it's really, really important that you understand we're not pulling in the same direction. Healthy teams pull in different directions. So you know what, guys? The rowers, they got to go. If they're on your wall, send, take, them, take them down. Okay, send me a picture. Okay, so we need a new metaphor. And here is a crazy, crazy story. I know it's silly, but everybody tells me it's super helpful, so I'm telling it anyway. This story comes from my family and my life. Many years ago now, my husband and I took our two daughters camping. It seemed like a good idea at the time. We had this tiny little tent with a skinny little rain fly protecting us from the elements. And it was great for the first two days because it was beautiful and sunny and amazing. It was just the third day when this giant storm was coming. Giant. And we hightailed it as fast as we could to the closest hardware store, searching for a tarp that was as big as we could possibly find. Hopefully one big enough to cover the whole tent, the picnic table, the campfire, maybe even all the way to the wash house if we could find one. But unfortunately, we weren't the first to have this idea. And the hardware store only had one sad looking little tarp left, barely bigger than the size of our tent. But it was the best we could do. So we brought it back with, the, to, back with us to the campsite. So here's the thing. We had to spread out this tarp over the tent. There were four of us, myself, my husband, our daughter who was five at the time, and our daughter who was nine. Okay, so the question is, were we pulling in the same direction? No, of course not. You can't pull out, unfurl a tarp by pulling in the same direction. You have to pull in different directions. So here we go. We have it. We have a metaphor for a team that's not pulling in the same direction. Well, the story goes on from there because what if hypothetically, one member of the team pulled too hard on his corner of the tarp. What would happen? Well, I can tell you what would happen. The five-year-old on the diagonal corner would fall flat on her face in the mud. Not good. And if he did it again, I can also tell you what would happen. He'd pull the rope right out of the grommet on the tarp. So, this happens on most teams that I work with. Somebody pulls too hard on their rope. It has a few bad effects. One, it can pull the whole tarp right off the tent. It's not centered. It's not the best decision for the organization anymore. It may be good for their function. Maybe the sales guy is given a good yank. And sure, it's a great answer for the customer. It's going to bring in lots of revenue. 
but maybe not in a way that's going to land you with lots of margin. So when you pull too hard, you pull the decision off center. It's no longer the best decision. So that's one thing that happens. The second thing, like my five-year-old, sometimes somebody gets hurt. Sometimes the person pulling so hard on that rope isn't thinking about how it affects the other people on the team. So that's a very common problem on teams. It's an unhealthy version of conflict when someone pulls too hard. Now, my family was not done there. My nine-year-old decided to get in on the action as well, but for her, it was the opposite. She was fed up. She was so done with us trying to get this tarp as big as we could and get it perfectly lined up over the tent. So she rolled her eyes and let go. And I'll tell you what happens when three people are pulling hard and one lets go. That tarp comes flying back up, leaving a whole corner of the tent completely exposed to the rain. I should have made her sleep in that corner that night. But that happens on your team as well. Someone, for whatever reason, they're more introverted, just more quiet. They're just so fed up of fighting or they, they feel that it's not right to be arguing. For whatever reason, sometimes somebody lets go and that leaves uh, the organization it leaves you exposed. There's some kind of a risk that hasn't been protected, or maybe it's a stakeholder that hasn't been thought about. So that's a huge problem. So now we have a new, albeit ridiculously silly metaphor, that can replace our rowers. Great organizations, they have tension. It's productive tension that makes the whole decision bigger and better for the company. But, but in a great team, you understand how those tensions are dynamic, how they're supposed to be there, and how it's your responsibility never to pull too hard and pull the decision off course or hurt someone, but also never to give up and, and let go because then you're not living up to your obligation. So these are some really, really important ideas that you can use with your team. So it turns out this is an exercise that I've written about lots of places. Um, There's a Harvard Business Review article about this if you'd like to check it out on teaching your team how to have conflict. What you do is you, you you make a picture of your own tarp on your team. Make a circle, divide it into as many segments as there are roles on your team. And then what you want to do is go around and for each role, answer three questions. I want you to do this with your team because it's amazing the insights you have when you do it. The first question, for this role, what is the unique value they bring? So I gave the example of sales and operations, but you know, let's add on to it uh, risk. And risk is always looking for what are we not anticipating? What are the things that could be happening in the outside world that might affect us? That's their unique value. Then answer the second question, what stakeholder is that group representing? Sometimes, you know, this, I gave an example of a food company, risk is often representing the regulator, the people who, the people who are um, the Food and Drug Administration, as an example, who that's the stakeholder they're thinking about. Is this going to pass inspection? Is this safe? Is this quality? So it's important to say, while sales is thinking so much about the customer and operations is thinking internally, that those risk folks, they're thinking about the regulators. No wonder they're putting some tension on our conversations. That's a very different perspective. And then you can answer the third question. What's the tension that's sometimes interpreted as, oh, so annoying, so frustrating, but what's the tension that's actually their obligation to put on the discussion, right? And risk, it's a great example. They have such a strong obligation to spot assumptions or play out other scenarios, anticipate what might go wrong. And we get frustrated with risk people. Oh, you're always talking about what's not going to work. Well, yeah, they are because that's their job. And it's their obligation to help us think proactively about what might go wrong. So once you've finished it for that role, go around and answer those three questions for each role on your team. What's their unique value? If they let go of their rope, what's the thing that won't be brought to the decision? Secondly, who is their stakeholder that they're focused on? Who defines their success? And who won't be represented if they're not contributing to the conversation? And third, what's that obligation they have to put tension when we are all feeling like, okay, I think we're there. I think we're ready to make the call. What's the tension that's their obligation, their responsibility to put on the decision? As you do this, you will have so many moments of like, 
oh, oh my goodness. Now I see that person wasn't trying to be a jerk. That's actually their job. It's absolutely amazing how often we've interpreted these productive, healthy, role-based tensions as interpersonal friction. And you know what friction does? It wears you down. The minute we understand that this is tension that makes us bigger, makes us better, not friction that's wearing us down, you will see the light bulbs go on for your team. I did this in a session in Atlanta last week, and we did the last session of the day before the cocktail hour. And one of the ladies came up to me. She said, I'll be late for the bar. I'll be there, but I have to go apologize. I got to go back to my hotel room and make a call to somebody who I treated really badly last week because I realized I was thinking about it as friction, not as healthy tension. So I really want you to try this exercise with your team. On my website, I've provided all the templates you need to do it with your team. Just download them for free, no problem. Use it because I'd love to see that people are having this insight. The tension is a feature, not a bug on a team. So that's just a couple of the big ideas from the good fight. One, this idea that we got to stop thinking about conflict as not nice or impolite or unprofessional. And we've got to start understanding that there's a case for conflict. Getting into conflict debt, it makes our organizations less productive, less innovative. It leaves risks unexposed. And it's super important for our organizations that we have conflict. Otherwise, we get into conflict debt. On our teams, that conflict debt looks like mistrust and and issues that get in the way of our relationships because we've never talked through them. And for us as individuals, if we've left conflict debt of, you know, not saying to somebody that, hey, I don't like how you're treating me or not being honest and open with our boss about the investment that's being made in us, well, then we take that stress on. We resent being a part of our organization or our team. And that conflict debt is too pricey. So that's one big idea. We've got to start seeing conflict as a healthy, important part uh, of, of being in an organization and to realize that some things are worth fighting for. But the second big idea is that we have to make that fight a good fight. And we have to see that, sure, there's supposed to be tensions, but always monitoring to make sure that they're in service of making the whole bigger, not of pulling somebody off track or only meeting our own needs. And we can use the TARP exercise and this story to help us map out what's the unique value of each role, who are the stakeholders that that this role is advocating for, and what's the tension that's their obligation to put on our discussions and decisions. So I hope that you will find one opportunity this week to take one conflict debt that your team has gotten into and make a payment at least. Uh, Use the TARP, some other strategy, but, but make a payment. Show that getting to the other side of conflict is what's really healthy. And then let's keep the conversation going. Tons of free resources, including those TARP uh, templates on my website at leannedavy.com. For the TARP templates, just go to leannedavy.com slash goodfight. But keep the conversation going on social media. I would love to, uh, I'd love to hear how you're applying these ideas. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a great day. Friends, if you like this episode of the LeadX Leadership Podcast, please take a minute, leave a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Ratings are invaluable for attracting new listeners. And I like to convert those listeners into leaders because you know I'm on a mission to spark 100 million leaders in the next 10 years. And if you want to become the boss everyone fights to work for and nobody wants to leave, check out the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda at leadx.org. And if you have 10 or more managers who could use some binge-worthy training, send me an email at info at leadx.org, L-E-A-D-X dot O-R-G, and we'll talk about getting you set up with a totally free pilot for those managers. See if they like it. If they don't, that's fine. We go away. Part as friends. But if they love it, you've just found yourself a new resource for them. Remember, leadership is influence. You're always leading. How are you going to leave today?